Today, we are going to talk about marijuana and cannabis, where it comes from, and exactly what it does to your brain and your body. So let's start with the numbers. Marijuana or cannabis is the most commonly used federally illegal drug in the United States. This gets confusing because there's 48.2 million people or at least 18% of Americans that have used it in the last year. And even though it's illegal federally, 21 US states have legalized it for recreational use. 39 states have legalized it for medical use. Recreational sales are expected to top $72 billion by the end of the year. Three in 10 people in the US have mud. What is mud? Mud is marijuana use disorder. I think it's named appropriately. Marijuana use disorder is when you are taking or ingesting more marijuana or weed than you intended. It's when you're having an incredibly hard time to quit using the product. It's when your use of marijuana causes it to influence or affect the things that are going on at home, at school, or at work, or in your relationships. You're also classified as having marijuana use disorder if, when you're trying to quit, you constantly have symptoms and recurrent strong cravings that you're unable to overcome. This is much higher marijuana use disorder in those who begin using marijuana before the age of 18. Let's talk about this group a little bit. One in four or 25% of pregnant adolescents use marijuana. This is severely detrimental to the developing brain. Since 2000, the year 2000, use amongst adolescents has increased by 245%. And one third of all 12th graders report that they've used marijuana with only 25% or one in four of them even seeing it as harmful to their health. Between 2017 and 2021, there was a study conducted. And this showed that there was a 1,400% rise in young children that have ingested cannabis edibles or had exposure to cannabis at home. 97% of those exposures occurred within those children's own home. And half of those cases were in children between the ages of two and three. 7,043 exposures occurred in children less than six years old. This is shocking and alarming. 2.2% of those children under the age of six struggled with a life-threatening condition. In fact, 8% of those children ended up being admitted to our critical care units. And 35 of those children were put on ventilators. In fact, right now, there's even a babysitter that has had a felony charge placed against her for filming herself giving a one-year-old a joint. So that's just part of the numbers. We now have even more specific numbers that we can detail. Let's go to Colorado. Since marijuana was legalized in Colorado, traffic deaths where drivers tested positive for marijuana use has increased 138%. Use in youth age 12 and up is higher than the national average by 61%. And what is probably most alarming to us as physicians is that treatment, those seeking treatment for marijuana use disorder has dropped by 34%. Apparently it's not as bad anymore because it's been legalized. Black market sales have also increased. So it's not just the legalization of it that has made it so not as much of it's being sold. Even the stuff on the black market gets sold more. Missouri is another case study in point, and I know there's many people out there that say the marijuana in Missouri is better than in Colorado. I wouldn't know. I've never used cannabis or marijuana, but let's look at the numbers. Sales in Missouri before marijuana was legalized 
totaled $37 million in the month after it was legalized in Missouri, $103 million of sales took place. Is marijuana about money or about medicine? Missouri projects that their total sales by the end of this year will be $1.2 billion, with the industry stating that the goal is to produce a pound of marijuana for $400 and make sure they can sell it for $2,300 per pound. Look, if you're not believing me, just look at Colorado. They've now collected over $2.39 billion in taxes and fees alone. But what's happened in Colorado over the last 10 or so years that they've legalized it? 66% of the jurisdictions now in Colorado have banned it. They have completely banned it for medical and recreational use. Why? Well, the why is, is because it is destroying the health of their citizens. It's tearing apart their social fabric in their communities, and it has led to increased suicides, overdoses, ER visits, hospitalizations, domestic violence, in street violence. This one's an alarming one. The percent of suicides that have been positive with tox screens for marijuana increased 20% in the year 2020 alone. Every statistic says that this is not having a positive effect on our health or on society. Are you being honest with yourself? Is it really having a positive effect in your life? So let's talk about the botany of this plant. Botany is the study, the scientific study of plants, their genetics, how they interact with one another as plants and how they interact with the environment and how they're classified. There are three main plant or plant varieties. The first one is cannabis sativa. The second one is cannabis indica. And the third one is Cannabis ruderalis. We're going to forego discussing Cannabis ruderalis in detail. These plants are all herbaceous flowering plants that are typically indigenous in Eastern Asia. In other words, that's where we believe that they originated or started growth, where we first started to see them when we go back through their evolutionary pathway. There are over seven hundred known strains and hybrids of these plants. And there is a history of therapeutic and recreational use of this plant going back over 4,500 years. Let's focus in a little bit more on cannabis sativa. This plant is taller, sometimes reaching anywhere from 5 to 18 feet in height. It's thin-leaved. There's few branches on it and it flowers when it is exposed to darkness that exceeds 11 hours a day. It is this plant that has higher amounts of THC. THC is the molecule or the chemical compound in marijuana or cannabis that people claim gives them an elevated or more focused or more uplifted mood or feeling. Cannabis indica is a shorter plant. It's more bushy. It has lots of complex and compact branching with lots more leaves. This plant has higher amounts of CBD, the molecule in marijuana, that is claimed to give people more calming, relaxing feelings and moods. It's interesting because in 1753, 1753, that long ago, Carl Linnaeus classified this plant, but it wasn't until 1964 when an Israeli chemist named Raphael Meckham identified its psychoactive component, identified as Delta-9 THC. However, even though it was classified in the 1700s, its psychoactive component identified in the 1960s, our technology Our understanding of the brain, its neural circuitry, our neural receptors was very limited. 
And this prevented us from having a good scientific understanding and performing the research necessary to understand how these molecules interacted in our brain and throughout our bodies. But just because science wasn't up to date in the 1960s, that didn't mean society wasn't going to keep experimenting with it. And all throughout the 1960s and the 1970s, hybridization of these plants to get different concentrations of THC or CBD in those plants ran rampant. That's the botany. And now we're going to talk about what these molecules do in the body. By 1988, science and research had advanced to the point where we were able to discover CBD1 receptors that were in the brains of vertebrates. The highest concentration of these CBD1 receptors were identified in the portions of the brain that help with cognition, that help us think, that help us plan, that help us regulate our moods and emotions, that help control our appetite, and help us with motor coordination or movement. These CBD1 receptors were also identified in our lungs, our liver, and our kidneys. Shortly afterwards, by 1992, the CBD2 receptor was identified and discovered, and this receptor was found throughout the body with particular concentrations in the digestive tract, the immune system, and other tissues. With the discovery of these receptors, this opened up a big question. With the question being, why? Are these receptors in our brains? And what do they do? To answer this question, we go back to the mid-1990s when we discovered that our brains create and make cannabinoids. We call these substances that we create and make within ourselves endocannabinoids within molecules that we make that come from within us. These endocannabinoids have one purpose, one main purpose, and that is to maintain the balance between our neuronal cells. They are there to function to provide homeostasis, to keep things at home, within balance. These endocannabinoids communicate effectively. They help us and our neurons communicate and talk at the right volume, at the right speed with each other, at the right pace, and to make sure that certain parts of our brain and certain feelings or moods or thoughts aren't done in excess. You see, these endocannabinoids help us regulate a lot of things in regards to our mood, our brain, our function, and our thoughts. They help us encode our memories. They help us deal with stress. They help us interpret and keep our hunger signals at bay. Endocannabinoids also regulate our body temperature. They can increase our motor coordination and they increase our alertness, our focus, and our balance. But in order to do all of these things and function in this way in our brains and throughout our bodies, there are three things that are needed. Number one, we need the endocannabinoid molecule itself. There are two endocannabinoids that we primarily talk about in neurology and neuroscience when we study the brain. One is anandamide. Anandamide is the primary endocannabinoid that our brains make and create and utilize to maintain this neuronal balance. The second one is 2-AG or 2-arachidonoglycerol. This one functions in a very similar but slightly different way. The second thing that we need in order to make this communication effective is we need a receptor, a thing for the molecule to bind onto, to create an action or to slow an action down. Those are the receptors and we spoke, focus specifically on CBD1 and CBD2. The third thing that we need are enzymes. Enzymes are the molecules that go in and break down these neurotransmitters to make sure that the levels of those neurotransmitters aren't too many, or make sure once they're utilized, they're removed from within the communication synapse or network of the neuron. So to summarize, endocannabinoids 
are molecules made within our bodies that help us maintain our homeostasis of communication between neurons. They help us with our memory. They help us deal with stress. They help us interpret hunger signals. They can help us with our motor control. They can also help us regulate temperature. So let's talk about how this all works in the brain. This is where I need your attention and your focus. The CBD receptor is the main receptor that we talk about. This receptor functions to pull back on excessive neurotransmission or communication. In other words, it helps turn down the volume of the interaction or the noise between our neurons. It's kind of like putting your foot on the brake to slow the signal transmission. This functions in three primary ways. Number one, you have a presynaptic neuron, a person who picks up the telephone to make a phone call to communicate with someone else. This presynaptic neuron releases neurotransmitters. Those neurotransmitters go across a space and they bind to a neuroreceptor or the other neuron on the other end of the call. When this happens, excitatory neurotransmitters activate endocannabinoid synthesis and release. These molecules then get released into the synapse. They go around and do their function, but the other thing they do is they come back and they bind to the CBD1 receptor. And when the endocannabinoids activate or trigger or turn on the CBD1 receptors, that leads to an inhibition or turns down the activity of the presynaptic neuron. In other words, hello, communication, this neuron, speaks back and the CBD1 receptor says, thank you, goodbye. So once the CBD1 receptor is activated, it inhibits or turns down further release of these excitatory neurotransmitters. The CBD2 receptor functions in a very similar fashion, but the way it works and where it works is a little different. It's in the GI tract and in your immune system. Now, cannabinoids, they interact with many other enzymes and many other receptors. This isn't a one-on-one -on -one phone call here. This is more like a large conference call where everybody is getting included. In fact, one of those receptors is a really cool receptor called the TRVP1 or the vanilloid receptor. This is just one of the other many receptors that cannabinoids, endocannabinoids work on. And what happens with this receptor is anandamide, remember one of our primary cannabinoids that is made within our brains and our bodies, anandamide goes and it binds on this TRVP1 receptor. And when it does, it desensitizes its pathway. It alters our perception or our reality of pain. So I guess the best way for you to think about endocannabinoids is to think about the runner's high. When a runner is out running and they reach that point where suddenly they feel good about what they're doing. That's the endocannabinoid system function. Even though their joints and their feet are pounding on the pavement or out on a trail and they're feeling some pain, these receptors help alter our perception of that pain and they give us a feeling or a sensation that our mood is elevated. We are feeling good about those things. In fact, this leads us right into the ways that we can naturally increase our endocannabinoids. There's several ways that we can do that. So how can we naturally increase these endocannabinoids, these molecules that we have that are created and made within our body that help us maintain the communications and homeostasis between the neurons in our brain? Well, number one is to exercise. We just talked about the runner's high that can come from exercising. Exercise also stimulates other neural networks. It helps with dopamine release and serotonin. It also helps you sleep. But getting quality sleep is another way that you can naturally increase your endocannabinoids, weight control, and stress management, and particularly avoiding environmental toxins, such as alcohol, the great brain poison. 
If you can do these things, you will naturally increase your endocannabinoid system and your brain will experience a real change from within that will help you throughout your entire life. These things and these tips will help you manage stress. They will decrease your anxiety. They will strengthen your relationships with others naturally. So I guess it's time to talk about THC, CBD, marijuana, and cannabis. When those molecules are talked about specifically, they are referred to as exogenous cannabinoids. These are molecules that come from outside of our body that we then ingest. And these are great mimics. These substances are taken into our bodies to try to mimic the effects of everything that we have just talked about. They're not very good at it. In fact, there's over a hundred known phytocannabinoids, meaning that they come from plants. Over a hundred of them. We only talk specifically and mostly about THC and CBD. There's a little bit of a difference between these two molecules when you look at their organic chemical structure. THC is more of a flat molecule. It has a closed ring on it and it has very high binding affinity. It can bind to a receptor and lock that receptor into its specific mode. CBD, on the other hand, has an open ring structure. It's a little more three-dimensional and it lacks, for the most part, the predominant psychoactive effects of THC. In CBD, because of its shape and its structure, has to bind to many more receptors in order for it to cause the effects that are postulated to occur for people who ingest exogenous cannabinoids. Let's look at CBD a little more closely. CBD functions to target fatty acid hydroxylates. When it does that, sometimes it can increase anandamide, increasing the natural endocannabinoid that we make. It also, however, binds the CBD1 receptor, activates the CBD1 receptor, and turns down the volume of our neurotransmission. It can also activate HT5, HT1 receptors. These are the receptors that deal with serotonin. It can also trigger and activate TRVP1 that we talked about, causing desensitization of our perception, particularly of pain. It also interferes with adenosine. It can bind to that receptor and it can mess it up with its inhibition or its pathway. PPARY gamma, GPR55. There's so many of these that we could have listed on the board. And all of these get affected when we take in exogenous compounds into our body. Let's get into this a little more. So can you tell me what the route, the dose, the frequency, or the side effects of medical marijuana are? Can you tell me what the drug-drug interactions are for medical marijuana? How is it prescribed? How is it regulated? I mean, is this how we administer antibiotics? We give you an antibiotic card and you can go choose which antibiotic you want to take? Is this how we prescribe antidepressants? What about immunosuppressants? Is this how we administer chemo meds? Are we just lying to ourselves here when we say there's such a thing as medical marijuana? I mean, there's four basic preparations of marijuana. Let's talk about them. The first one are fresh leaves, flowers. These things can be ground down into a paste. They can be put in drinks. They can be made into little balls. They can be made into other things. There's hash. This is typically composed of the trichomes and extracts of the plant. This can increase the THC component of marijuana by up to eight times its natural potency when it's given to somebody. The other thing that you can do is you can have an oil or solvents in the extract. These solvents, like when we extract the oil from it, can increase the potency of these products by up to 90 times. The other way is leaves, flowers, buds, etc. They can be smoked or they can be formed into edibles. 
But let's not forget that whenever we light something on fire or we breathe in smoke, we get all the byproducts that are associated with that. All the inhalation exposures, the butane that's associated with it, and the one that we see a lot in the hospital, lipoid pneumonias. Yeah, that's right. Nobody at your local dispensary tells you about oil-filled lungs from smoking marijuana or using cannabidiol oil or vaping. Well, maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, it's all just big pharma. Everything has to be regulated by big pharma. Let's talk about big pharma then, because maybe it is an industry thing. Well, there are some medical forms or pharmaceutical grade products that are out there. Let's talk a little bit about them. Sativex is an oral mucosal spray that contains 2.7 milligrams of THC and 2.5 milligrams of CBD. It can be given for patients that have multiple sclerosis associated spasticity, neuropathic pain, bladder spasms, and cancer pain. It can be administered up to 12 sprays a day. Hasn't been approved for use in the United States. But do you see what I'm getting at? How many of these other formulations that you get with your medical marijuana card give you a route and a dose and tell you these kinds of things? The second product that we have on the market is Sesame. This is a synthetic cannabinoid. It was designed in the lab to mimic THC. It's used to treat nausea and vomiting that are associated with chemotherapy drugs. It can be dosed one to two milligrams, taken twice a day. And what do we now have? Side effects. The side effects can be vertigo, dizziness, dry mouths, and psychotomimetic reactions. What are those, brain Dr. Chandler? Those are hallucinations, delirium, fear, panic, intense anxiety attacks, changes in your perception of time, space, mood, and your thoughts. Do you see what's going on here? I'm trying to teach you what THC consumption can actually do to your brain when it triggers all of the receptors and the pathways and messes with the complex neurocircuitry that we've already talked about. These are the things that happen. Marinol is another product. Marinol is also a synthetic THC. It's used to treat anorexia-associated weight loss in adults that have AIDS. It can also treat nausea and vomiting with chemotherapeutic drugs. And it comes with dosing and it comes with frequency guidelines as well. Now there's another product that's out and that's Epidiolex. Epidiolex is probably the most familiar of these products to brain doctors, neurologists, and particularly to epileptologists, brain doctors that treat epilepsy. Epidiolex is a purified oral form of CBD, and it has been FDA approved to use for severe epilepsy syndromes, Lennox-Gastau and Dravet syndrome. But again, look at the risks associated with this purified form of CBD. Suicidal thoughts, agitation and aggression, depression, panic attacks, liver injury, nausea, vomiting. It can cause stomach pain and give you jaundice or yellow skin and yellow eyes. But Dr. Chandler, how can this be when so many other voices say that CBD treats arthritis, it takes away my pain, it's the best treatment for anxiety I've ever heard of. Well, you can't start messing with all of these receptors in your brain, especially with exogenous or outside cannabinoids coming into your body. If you think about it, it's kind of easy to understand. If everybody has different fingerprints, that's nothing compared to the trillions of different neural connections that each of us have in our brains that are drastically different from one another's. This is why some people may get one side effect and they may get a different side effect. 
This is why one person may have one experience with marijuana versus another one with marijuana. But in the end, it all comes down to the harm that these products can cause. In fact, I want to read to you specifically what the FDA has said about medical marijuana and recreational marijuana use. Quote, the FDA understands that there is increasing interest in the potential utility of cannabis for a variety of medical conditions, as well as research on the potential adverse health effects from use of cannabis. To date, the FDA has not approved a marketing application for cannabis for the treatment of any disease or condition. The agency has, however, approved one cannabis-derived product, Epidiolex, and three synthetic cannabis-related drug products. We've mentioned these. These approved drug products are only available with a prescription from a licensed healthcare provider. Importantly, the FDA has not approved any other cannabis, cannabis-derived, or cannabidiol CBD products currently available on the market. So by now, I'm sure you're convinced that medical marijuana isn't a real thing yet. And we've talked about how the brain is a trillion times more complex than even our own individual fingerprints. This is one of the reasons why we do large clinical trials where we get huge populations so that we can get a large sample size and see how people react or respond to different formulations of medications. That's not being done with medical marijuana. Yes, there are studies that are currently underway and that's the important part of trying to understand how this all works. But I've got to tell you about the brain. This is perhaps the most important part of everything that we have talked about leading up to now. And that is what marijuana or weed or CBD oil does to your brain, the actual brain itself. Number one, consumption of exogenous cannabinoids destroy and damage your orbital frontal cortex. It causes it to shrink and to wither away, especially with long-term use defined as greater than six years of consumption. The problem is, is when you ingest these things, it damages the neurons and the interactions and the cell receptors that lead to poor decision-making. They make it so it disrupts your thought planning, your thought execution. It decreases your ability to process information. In fact, it makes it harder for you to place emotions and moods in the appropriate social context that they're in. This can lead to senses of disorientation, panic. It can cause fear in individuals when they smoke marijuana or ingest weed. This all happens in the bifrontal orbital cortex and it causes shrinking of the gray matter. This is where all the decision-making cells are. When that gray matter is getting shrunk or withered away from the ingestion of these substances, the communication or information pathways, the white matter tracks, initially increase in size and frequency. That's in a part of the brain called the forceps minor that connects these hemispheres together. Why is the brain responding this way? It's responding this way because it's not getting as much signal. If it doesn't have as much signal, it tries to increase the pathways to keep the signal going back and forth. Remember, this endocannabinoid system is there to help you maintain balance. And so if I'm losing the ability to think, to do executive process and planning, I'm gonna try to increase the connections to make these things go quicker. The problem is, is they're initially increased, but then the brain can't keep up and they decrease. And this experiences atrophy in this area as well, or shrinkage of the brain. The problem with this is that we no longer see or seek long-term gratification. We lose sight of our big picture goals and end up starting to have other pathways that are reinforced with dopaminergic circuits or serotonin circuits that these molecules and chemicals are also stimulating. This means that we also have an increased risk of anxiety, panic, and perhaps one of the things we see the most is a decrease in self-confidence. You don't trust yourself as much. 
you don't see yourself how you really are or the goals that you've really established for yourself. And if you combined number one, orbital frontal cortex shrinking, and number two, decreased forceps minor activity, you get more moody, more anxious, and more depressed. And this leads to increased psychosis. In fact, it's upwards of three-fold in patients that smoke weed. Psychosis is hallucinations. It's delusions. It's random thoughts that you're not able to control. It's fear, panic, all combined into one. You're starting to lose your mind. And in reality, you are. It's shrinking and withering away. This is one of the major contributors to anxiety and depression in young adults and teenagers. The changes in these endocannabinoid systems, they mess everything up inside of you. Remember, these CBD1 receptors aren't just in the brain and in the spinal cord. You also have CBD receptors throughout the rest of your body. Let's get back to the brain because it's not just the orbital frontal cortex. It's not just the forceps minor. Your cerebellum is affected. You have decreased signaling activity in the cerebellum that leads to difficulty with balance, coordination, and slows your reaction times. We already talked about the number of traffic accidents in Colorado since legalization of marijuana. Perhaps the one that's most dear to my heart is the hippocampus. The hippocampus is the memory center of the brain. And when you slow this communication in the brain, in the hippocampus, by ingesting these products, especially when THC and CBD bind to the receptors in the hippocampus, this slows and prevents memory formation and memory consolidation. And in the hypothalamus, the portion of the brain that is responsible for regulating satiety or hunger, it affects that too. THC and CBD upregulate neurocommunication for hunger. It's the munchies that people get. So do you see how people lose their confidence? They can become more anxious. They can get a depressed mood. They can't think as clearly, form executive planning. They get more hungry and they can't have as quick of reaction times. And then their memory is also shot. Look, when it comes to marijuana, weed, and cannabis, recreational use on the whole is without a doubt harmful. This is the truth about marijuana. I hope you watch and listen to the whole video. Think about the effects of marijuana on society. Be honest with yourself and with your friends and share this video with others. So let me share with you why this is personal. I see patients in the hospital all of the time. Hundreds of thousands of our patients come in after having used marijuana. Oftentimes, this marijuana that they get from a trusted source or from a good friend is laced with things, meaning that maybe it has fentanyl in it. Maybe it has cocaine in it. Maybe it has something you're not suspecting is in it. And because all of us are different with different neuroreceptors and different reactions to products that we put in our bodies, these substances can cause different things to happen. I will never forget sitting at the bedside of a young man while he looked at his friend on a ventilator and watched him die who had both smoked the same joint but had two completely different outcomes. This happens. It happens regularly. That's why I'm trying to tell you the truth.